Hello and welcome to Share, Learn, Connect. I am Georgia Lutby and I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we meet today. Down employs people across more than 300 sites, primarily in Australia and New Zealand, but also in the Asia-Pacific region, South America and Africa. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging and recognise and celebrate the diversity of First Peoples across all of the various lands, their ongoing cultures and connections to the land, sea and community. You are going to love our topic and guest today where we talk about all things courage. Nelson Mandela once said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. And research has really shown that courage is actually born out of vulnerability, not out of strength. Things such as engaging in challenging conversations, falling in love, admitting that you are wrong, which can be very hard, asking for help, they're not just acts of vulnerability, they're also acts of bravery. And it's with great excitement that I welcome Melanie Blow a manager and leader within Downer's learning and development team, and Donna Viner, a group health advisor within Downer's Zero Harm team. Could you please start by telling me a little bit about yourselves? I'm Mel. At Downer, I am the manager of learning and development. At home, I have a husband, Chris, two kids, Talia and Parker, a dog called Molly, and a cat called Darth. Oh, and Donna. I'm a group health advisor here within the group health team. I'm a registered psychologist by background. Sit over here in Perth, so over here in the West, in the home world, lovely partner Mike and two boys, Cooper and Evan, and a cat called Licorice. Well, thank you both very much for taking the time. Donna, mental health can often be associated with courage. Can you tell me a little bit about what that means to you? The courage to step forward and have those conversations. Mental health has been a topic sort of hidden behind the shadows got to have the courage to reach out if I'm not traveling too well and having the courage to trust that other people are going to be there and there's not going to be that pushback. Absolutely. Mel? Courage to me is stepping outside of your comfort zone in situations whilst you're stepping up and having courageous conversations. I think you lean into yourself as well and really dig deep and find strength. You know, when I grew up, it was very much if you had a worry, it was like, oh, don't worry about it. And you don't stop worrying about it because your body's worrying about it, your mind's worrying about it, and your heart's worrying about it. But now I think I've got children myself who are starting to talk about feelings and the fact that it's okay to not be okay and really just having conversations regularly. And making connection. Today you're going to hear a story about someone that Mel worked with. For the purposes of this episode we're going to call her Cherie. Cherie is not her real name. We have changed it and this is a true story. Please note that this episode contains discussions about mental health and psychological distress which some listeners may find upsetting. You'll find that the story will have some ups and some downs but ultimately it does end well. If at any point the content of this episode is triggering to you and you need support please call the Employee Assistance Program. Their details are on iDowner or a crisis support service. Can you take us back to the beginning about when you first met Cherie? I first met Cherie probably 2008. We worked in a large corporate business in a sales environment. Cherie was an absolute pocket rocket. She was really self-motivated and was quite self-led, which was really quite delightful. And one day you noticed that things weren't the same with Cherie. Can you tell me a little bit about that? It started really slow, really slow. And hindsight's a beautiful thing. It was a couple of late mornings. And when I say that, I don't mean late for work time. I mean late for Cherie time, you know, 10 minutes after everyone else. Cherie also started to go out for lunch, which I thought was a great thing. And I thought, she's creating a new habit. I did tell her that she shouldn't shove that sandwich down within five minutes and get back to work. So she's listening to me. She's going out and having lunch. And then our lunch break started extending. There were a couple of days where she didn't come back from lunch. All isolated incidents were quite small, but when you do marry them up, it was all starting to stack up. Donna, hearing this story, what are you hearing from a psychologist's perspective? It's probably a a realistic scenario. In that moment, there's only small little changes, not significant in isolation, maybe as they started to add up. And probably my question back to Mel would be, at what point from, okay, this is just a little bit out of the ordinary into, oof, this is something a little bit more. Unfortunately for me, I had a key indicator, which I probably shouldn't have waited for. And it was the first month that she didn't reach her targets. Cherie hadn't ever missed a target. We had the whiteboard because we're in the sales environment and everyone needed to see the leaderboard and I had to wipe Cherie's name off the top. She had a great month in comparison to some people, but it wasn't a Cherie month. I think the spiral just continued at that point. 
the mornings became later. She started to leave early on some days. And some days she'd say, oh, I've got to go, I've got to run, I've got an appointment. Other times I'd turn around and she just wouldn't be at her desk. There was one day that I didn't actually hear from her. I feel awful that I waited that long to try and check in with her. But when I rang her, she answered the phone and she said, oh, look, I'm, I'm really sorry. I just couldn't get up today. I didn't really know what to say. I thought, well, maybe she just needs to have a couch day, a doona day. Wouldn't that be lovely? I'm like, great, you know, watch a couple of movies, have a glass of wine tonight and we'll see you tomorrow. I can hear in Mel's story, almost 15 years on, there's this element of almost guilt. Is this something people can commonly feel? Oh, most definitely. I used to have a clinical supervisor that any time I said should, they would shut me down on the spot and say could. What I was hearing from Mel is, yeah, you're in a working environment. You've got a lot of other people within your team. You've got your own self things going on. I'd say be kind to yourself, Mel. You're doing the best that you can with the information at the time in that context where other things were going on around you. She's had her doing the day. She did come back to work, but I think she didn't fully come. And this is when I found things got really hard because the team started to talk to me about it. They were coming to me saying, we're taking Cherie's calls, Cherie's late all the time, Cherie leaves early, Cherie goes to lunch and doesn't come back. That's not the kind of team member that that we want to have. So I started doing Cherie's work for her as well as my, my boss. At that point, his direction was not a find out if she's okay and help her. It was a get rid of her and find another Cherie so we can hit our targets. I don't think I was brave enough at that point to say, how dare you? Cherie's carried all of this team for months and months and months on end. So I reached out to Cherie and said, look, I'd like to have the are you okay conversation. I'm worried about you and the team's worried about you. We do, as a business, need you functioning and you're so incredible at your job and I know everything that you're capable of and I'm not seeing that now and I can't help you if you don't clue me in on what this is. I thought I was creating a safe space and I let her know that whatever she told me, I wasn't going to disclose. I just needed her to help me help her. She closed the conversation off pretty quickly and didn't come in the next day. Donna, with leaders where they are aware perhaps of someone's personal situation and the team are having this emotional reaction about pulling their weight, what should a leader do in that situation? What could a leader do in that situation? (laughs) Mel, you didn't really know at that stage what was truly going on for Cherie. When you get those questions from the group, is being able to give enough information. It's not disclosing sensitive or personal information, but if if Mel knew enough to be able to go, look, this is a temporary state of being. I'm fully in the loop. We have a short-term plan. Thank you for working alongside this. If the shoe was on the other foot, I'm sure we'd get in and we'd help each other as a team, but a leader only knows what's been communicated with them. I suppose in this moment, it's not a bit of a us against them you know, who's right, who's wrong, really stepping back and going, what is the best outcome for Cherie? What can we do in this moment? Maybe for Mel as well, how much longer can I keep doing this? Like, what are my boundaries? Most of the employee assistance program contracts we have as an employee has a manager support service. Now, you don't need to have manager in your title. It's not about myself, but I've got a presenting situation. Reach out for the services that are behind the scenes, like manager support program. You've had a conversation, a courageous conversation. How did you feel in that? Oh, my heart was in my throat. I was shaking. I was stumbling over my words. When she didn't open up and when she left and when she didn't come back the next day, I was at a loss. I had met her partner and I messaged him and I said, look, I'm really worried about Cherie. He said at that point, Cherie has depression and anxiety. She has a diagnosis. She lives a a great life, but it can come and go. And she's in one of her lows at the moment and it it is pretty low. He was quite surprised that I was showing support. He thought that we were being quite heavy handed on her, that we were applying a lot of pressure. He was quite surprised that I was worried about her. I thought, are you serious? Months now, I have been trying to get the team to understand what's happening without talking too much about it. I have been holding back the boss. I personally have been working a lot of hours to try and hold up 
and putting results that I was achieving on Cherie's board and there was a big disconnect when we were sitting at that table. She'd had a slightly different experience of me trying to reach out and help her. I did say, look, I would like you to know that I absolutely do support Cherie and that I have reached out and that I want to do what's best for her, but I need her to help me. He went home and he messaged me later and said, Cherie will be at work tomorrow and she can have a chat with you. Tomorrow morning came and I got a text message come up on my phone and it said, I can't do it. And I thought, can't do what? I picked up my mobile and I rang her and I said, can't do what? Where are you? I really need you to come in. And she said, I tried to come in. I'm at the transit centre. I can't get on the bus to go home. I can't come down to work. I'm stuck at the transit centre. I excused myself from work. I ran up to the transit centre and it was one of those moments where people kind of parted and I saw her. She was quite red. Her shoulders were really slumped. I knew at that moment that she wasn't well. Her face was just saturated and I just hugged her and hugged her and hugged her and I didn't let go and she was sobbing and it was awful. But I actually felt glad And I feel awful saying that, but it was the answer to everything that had happened. And I knew that the fight that I had put in was for the right reason and that everything that was telling me to keep persisting was right and it was worth the effort. Donna, what could someone do in this situation? This sounds like a crisis point. This is that reaching out to have a professional come into the mix. The Employee Assistance Program is a psychologist in your pocket. It's 24-7. When you ring through to the EAP, it's like ringing your GP's rooms. So probably in Mel's scenario would be that reaching through and going, we really need some same day counselling. If someone's reluctant to go to the EAP is understanding some of those community resources, the crisis lines, the helplines that sit there behind the scenes as well. At what point would you take someone to a hospital, for example, versus calling the EAP? Probably what we alluded to there is that definition of crisis. And from a technical point of view, from a psychological point of view, crisis would be there's potential harm to self. There's potential harm to society, community around them, and they're unable to make their own conscious or good decisions at this moment in time. A lot of people, in my experience, have found it hard to check in with people. Can you talk to me a little bit about boundaries? Each situation is going to be very different if you are familiar with the individual Of course, go there. If it's not myself, if there's somebody else you'd like to feel comfortable. And boundaries will be really specific. I know in Mel's story, she said that she actually knew Cherie and her husband outside of that working environment. If we've gotten into a stage where someone's in a really low point, if there is that next of kin contact and in that friends type of context is totally fine. Thanks, Donna. So Mel, what happened next? I said, well, what do we do? Is this a doctor thing? I'm not sure. And she had a contact for a psych. I got Cherie. We walked down to the psych. The psych met us at the door. I just walked back to work and started plugging away. I went back and got Cherie and the psych said, okay, uh, Cherie's ready to go home now. And she got on her bus and hugged me and drove off on the bus. And then I was standing in the transit centre again by myself, wondering what just happened. I said to my husband, I don't really know what just happened today because I didn't have any understanding still of what was going on and I hadn't gotten myself any help. I went to work the next day and 7.30 in Brussels, Cherie. Everyone turned their heads because she really hadn't been in for probably a month at this point. And she was happy. She popped the phone on. She opened her computer and she just started working. Everyone went, okay, she's back. And I was really happy for her. Sheree kept coming. And she said to me, look, I'm I'm still seeing my psych. Thanks for your help. It's under control now. Was that the end of that chapter? It came and went, but not as low as it was? Never that low again. She's absolutely dipped again over the period. But I think I understand her signs a lot better now. And she absolutely leans into me when she needs to. What would your advice be, Donna, for Mel at this point? If there was a perfect scenario, maybe getting a little bit, what do I need to know? Either Cherie or the psych, 
What's my role? How can I be supportive moving forward? All those types of things. And if it wasn't doable in that time, debrief, calling through to the EAP or a psychologist if there's one within your world and going, I've just gone through this experience. Is this typical? Keeping that conversation because it seems like, yeah, the curtain got pulled backwards and then it got pulled back pretty quickly to go, nothing to see here. Smile away, put the mask back on again. She saw the psychologist that day. That's really been a turning point for her. Donna, is it this magic potion? So there wasn't an instant cure. One session doesn't make someone fixed, but it would have been referencing back to, you got this girl. There is hope on the horizon. I've been there before. Starting back on that recovery journey. Early intervention is key. If there was one thing I'd say is go and see your psychologist once a year. There might be a reluctance to go to a professional. So the other support might be that best mate you can talk to, might be a mentor, somebody that you just feel really comfortable to open up, talk about what's happening and then start those problem solving kind of scenarios as well. What are the benefits of people speaking to someone? This is the whole concept behind therapy is you walk around on your everyday basis with your thoughts, your ideas running around in your own head. Once you've got to get them out of up there, out of your brain, out through your mouth, you've got to put them in order so that you can explain what you're experiencing to somebody else. And the amount of times during counselling, I've had people actually say, now that I'm saying it out loud, like if Mel at that time had said, okay, I am going through quite a bit at this moment. Doesn't mean I'm not there to help my work friend, but just recognising that there's a lot going on in this piece. Mel, what did you learn and what do you now apply in your role as a leader? That's a great question, Georgia. I'm not a perfect leader at all, but I try and work with my team, my stakeholders, and just be myself at all times. Try to share Some people will tell you I'm an oversharer, but that's okay. Just create a culture very early on when I meet people that there is nothing you can't say. This is an absolute safe space. And when you're leading a team of people that like to have work-life balance and do that well, that that's okay and it's accepted and that you understand that people can contribute in a broad spectrum and they don't need to be sitting at their desks from 7.30 to 5.30 to be contributing. Donna, mental Health Month is October and this is something that Downer has got a huge focus on. Can you talk me through a little bit about what Mental Health Month means and what people can do during the month? Mental Health Month is really just taking stock. We've just had Are You OK Day. We will be releasing some webinars that Group Health Team will be doing. We have Beyond Blue, which we're very much normalised and so proud that Downer has that major partnership. And on a weekly basis, we are rolling out mental health first aid training it's a new focus. It's very much getting kind of blended into that health and safety space. Having a workplace that is psychologically healthy is really important. And that flow on effect for employees feeling that they're supported in the workplace and that there's plenty of opportunities to reach out for help. What are some common warning signs that managers can look out for with their teams and what can they do and what action should they take in those situations? The warning signs would be anything that's off the typical baseline. And that's step one is getting to know those people within your team and then recognising when they're starting to shift away from that. We sort of talk about it in some of our training where we talk about putting on the mask. We push on through and that's part of that script. There might be small cracks starting to appear. We can't be going 24-7. We've got to stop glorifying busy and that we can do it all, take it all on, have different hats and, you know, make it all happen. Just check in. How are you going? Honestly, you know, the door's always open. My ear's always open, those types of things. It's been a tough year, a tough couple of years for people. (laughs) What would your message be to those who are listening who might just be having a bit of a tough time? Probably ride the waves. You know, we're in the same storm. We're in different boats, so we can't presume to know each other's experience. Be informed, but not overwhelmed. What do I need to know? Switching off, we can't have that 24-7 news cycle coming at us. It's almost vicarious trauma. Really switching off when we can and only taking on board, what do I need to know? Be okay to reach out for help. We're not traveling okay. And normalizing that everybody else is probably feeling pretty similar. Well, thank you both so much for your time. It has been such a pleasure to speak with both of you today. Thank you. Thank you. It was so insightful hearing Mel's stories about her courage. She was courageous in speaking with her leader to make sure that he understood where Shuri was and being a fierce advocate for her. There was courage in the way that she went out of the box to make sure that she checked that Shuri was okay and showing up at that transit centre, I felt goosebumps on my arms hearing that story. And hearing the science behind it from Donna, 
If you or anyone you know may not be feeling like your best self, it's okay to not be okay. Reach out to someone, call the Employee Assistance Program, speak to a friend, call the Crisis Helpline if you need to. I want to end with a quote from Brene Brown. We can measure how brave you are by how vulnerable you're willing to be. Be courageous and have those conversations. Reach out if you need to and take care. And before we finish up, I would like to take the time to acknowledge the Yuggera people, the traditional custodians of the land where this episode has been recorded. Make sure you tune into next month where I speak to a brand new guest about a brand new topic as we continue to share, learn, connect. This podcast is now available on your favourite podcast app. Please share it with your friends and make sure to subscribe. And what that means is that you will get our episodes as soon as they drop. Our producers are Darby Martinelli and Melanie Blows and I'm Georgia Lutby. Thank you for listening.